Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to discuss a pretty popular dietitian, anti-diet dietitian on TikTok. Get ready to be confused and or furious. uploading a video in live time. I literally received this email four minutes ago from a local hospital chain that just happens to be hiring registered dietitian. As a registered dietitian myself, this just boils my blood. Don't worry, not gonna take that job. Whoever is in charge of making these marketing emails needs to be fired immediately, or at least get some training in fat phobia and weight stigma and diet culture. This is the photo that they choose to use for hiring a registered dietitian. She's a fucking tape measure around her neck, and of course, that just bowl of fruit and that crisp apple. Now, nothing against fruit or apples, that's fine, whatever. But the tape measure around the neck. It's literally saying, hey, I'm fat phobic as fuck and I'm gonna measure you and probably fat shame you. But people will often ask me, you know, why do you bash on your title? You're a dietitian, like, you know, it took so long to get there. Yeah, it did take long to get here, but there's also a lot of things that need to change. And when I see shit like this, I'm just like, ugh, there's so much work to be done. At first I thought this video was about the fact that the woman in the picture is skinny and I was like, what's wrong with that? I didn't even notice the tape measure. But why is it a big deal? Did she just make the argument that tape measures as a dietitian are fat phobic? And the really quick issue she had with the fruit bowl had me blown. It's fruit. It's healthy. She's a dietitian. This TikTok did not go where I thought, but if your criteria for choosing a job or judging a dietetics practice comes down to an image with some fruit and a tape measure, that seems a bit extreme. When you think about breastfeeding and intuitive eating, they're very similar. My doula had said this to me, get to know your baby, not an application. And I couldn't agree more. If I teach people how to listen to their body, then why would I be diligently tracking when my baby's telling me when she's hungry, when she's not hungry, trying to figure it out? She also tells me when she's full because then she stops eating. Needless to say, my breastfeeding experience thus far has been a very humbling experience to reiterate and ground me in the intuitive eating principles. Babies cry when they're hungry, they stop when they're full. That has always been an analogy that I have taught over and over and over again with Find Food Freedom. This woman is an intuitive eating only dietitian, and she says that since babies know how to eat intuitively to consume breast milk, then we as adults should all be able to eat intuitively as well. But breast milk to babies is like fruit and vegetables to an adult. We usually don't overeat fruits and vegetables because they are the most natural foods for us to eat as humans. Unlike processed foods like cakes or chips that are very unnatural for humans to consume and therefore really hard to eat intuitively and in proper amounts. This same argument could be made for not going to a gym to exercise. Because infants walk around and they exercise naturally every day. They don't need a gym, so why should I as a grown adult go to the gym? Um, because we're not babies. And we don't live in a time where it's easy for a lot of people to get exercise naturally as part of their daily routines. So we go to a gym. We were just recording a podcast and the guest said something that made me stop in my tracks. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, so many people think this. Most people think that intuitive eating dietitians and counselors don't care about nutrition or movement. And it's not that we don't care about it but we know that your nutrition intake and your movement are not the only two things that affect your health. They are two of a shit ton of things that affect your health. When we look at health, we take a step back and look at a much broader view. Mentally, physically, emotionally, what is going on? We help you remove the guilt and shame so you can start to make behavior changes that actually feel pleasant, physically, mentally, emotionally. But if you think that just changing what you eat and moving your body more, basically focusing on shrinking your body, is going to just like reset your health or your gut or whatever the fuck it is, that is such a diet culture way of thinking. This woman is under the assumption that intuitive eating is the best way to eat for everyone and that it will improve everyone's mental and physical health. But what if non-intuitive eating makes you feel better? 
She says that she looks to holistically improve people's mental, physical, and emotional health, but what if counting calories or restricting food intake to specific times of the day actually does improve someone's mental, emotional, and physical health? Like, for example, a lot of binge eaters who might benefit from more structure around the times of day that they eat. You cannot aim to holistically improve a wide range of people's health as a dietitian and only provide a single way of eating, which is intuitive eating in this case. People are very different, and different things work for different people. Let's talk about Easter candy some more. So in a previous video you saw I put up some bags of sweet tart jelly beans, and you can see the only ones left are the purple and the yellow. And that's because I have a hierarchy of jelly beans. Pink first, then it's a mix between the green and the orange, then blue, and then honestly I'm gonna throw these away. Like I literally don't like them. And I got so many messages of people saying like, but if I buy Easter candy, I can't just have the serving. Who said you were only allowed to have the serving? And I say that because I think there's this misunderstanding that if you're an intuitive eater that you only eat the serving and that's all you want and you just have a little and then you're satisfied. No, not necessarily. I've been housing these jelly beans and I love them. And I'm kind of getting to the point with them where I'm like, you know what, <clears throat> another jelly bean doesn't sound that good. And so why I'm telling you this is it's okay to have a large volume of candy in a sitting or over the course of a few days. These sweet tart jelly beans are not available often. And I'm like, okay, we're done with the jelly beans. And then we carry on living our lives. Knowing that if you feel too full or uncomfortable from an eating experience, that that feeling will pass. So we should eat however much we want all the time I get that eating in excess on occasion is okay. The old adage is everything in moderation, including moderation. But this mentality that if these jelly beans are only around once a year, I should stuff myself until I'm sick of them isn't good for most people. Because there are so many seasonal items that you could do this year round. Easter candy? Oh, gotta get my jelly beans. Beginning of summer? Gotta have my fill of sangria and margaritas. 4th of July, all the hamburgers and hot dogs I could possibly eat. The beginning of fall, gotta consume all the pumpkin spice flavored treats I can find. It's a never ending cycle and people can live in that mentality year round. And you don't need to eat a seasonal item until you're sick of it until the next year. That seems unhealthy. I don't know why a dietitian would be encouraging that. And considering most people in the United States are overweight, I don't think the including moderation part of that original quote is what people need to hear, which is what she's encouraging. Be the everything in moderation part, which is what more people should get. They need the everything in moderation part, which is what more people should get. So I personally don't like the food waste of throwing away the jelly beans that she doesn't like. I get that it's candy, but I don't like the normalization or encouraging of food waste. Okay, so let's talk about this real quick. This comment, completely valid. Your discomfort, whatever you feel in your body is valid. I want to challenge this thought and just plant a seed with you. Do you think that people in smaller bodies also feel back pain or knee pain? And if yes, which we know this is true, would you tell them to lose weight? in order to help with their knee or back pain. No, right? If they reside in a body that you consider normal and or air quotes, healthy weight, whatever that means, um, you would not suggest weight loss to alleviate knee and back pain. What are things you would suggest to someone in a smaller body for pain management? Acupuncture, potentially. Physical therapy. Depending on the person, maybe it's rest if they're super active. Or maybe for somebody else, they need to be more mobile. We need to actually like get their joints moving and we need to incorporate more walking or activity, yoga, stretching, things like that. Again, everything that I just named, we can do regardless of the size of your body. And that's where when I talk about that weight is not a behavior, I'm not anti-human beings losing weight. If your body naturally loses weight from eating more variety of foods, more nutrient dense foods, engaging in movement that you enjoy, adopting additional coping mechanisms in addition to food if food was your only coping mechanism before again everything that i'm naming those are individual behaviors so when i say weight is not a behavior i'm not anti-humans losing weight but what if 
What if we stop saying, I need to lose weight for my health, and we change that narrative to, I need to drop the guilt and shame around food, body image, and movement so I can make behavior changes that are gonna make me feel physically, mentally, emotionally pleasant. Just like I said in my last video, you have full body autonomy. You can say, shut the fuck up. I don't wanna hear any of this. But I invite you to get curious because if weight loss was the only way to fix back and knee pain, then people in smaller bodies would never have back or knee pain, period. She asked the question, do you think people in smaller bodies also feel back pain and knee pain? What a stupid question. Of course they do. But the real question is, do you think smaller people will get knee pain and back pain because of their body size? That is the real question. Because asking that question is like asking someone who's trying to quit smoking to prevent lung cancer or other health issues, and you respond, let me ask you a question. Do you think there are people that don't smoke that also get lung cancer? Well, yes. Exactly. So please continue smoking into old age. It's fine. The point of going to a doctor is to get personalized information about your specific health conditions. If someone has joint pain and they're overweight, a doctor might suggest weight loss. But if you're not overweight, they probably won't do it because it depends on the circumstances. Just like a doctor wouldn't recommend someone to stop smoking if they have lung issues, if they don't smoke. And at the end of the video, she even said, weight loss isn't the only way of reducing back and knee pain. Yeah, but it's obviously one of the ways. Yoga and acupuncture aren't going to work for everyone. She gave out all these treatments for back and knee pain, like yoga, acupuncture, physical therapy, exercise. But that list can't include weight loss because apparently carrying an extra 10 or 20 or 200 pounds on your body couldn't possibly cause your joints to hurt. That's ridiculous and fat phobic. Why would you even say that? But what I wanted to share is what is fat acceptance? Because there's so much misinformation out there that people think that fat acceptance is believing that everybody should be fat, hating straight sized people or thin people, forcing everyone to find fat people attractive. A lot of times I hear people say that fat acceptance is an excuse to just be lazy or greedy or that it's anti-health. But what Vinny has taught our team and continues to teach thousands of others, and I will tag them below, is that fat acceptance is a social justice movement. It was created to increase the acceptance of fat bodies. And it seeks to ensure that fat people have the exact same rights and access as straight sized people. That's it. So when I see videos like the one I put up previously, which go watch it, it, it boils my blood. And when I see the comments of people saying, you're just promoting obesity or blah, blah, blah. We're just asking for basic human decency and respect of human beings. Anybody in the intuitive eating or anti-diet space, if they are not talking about fat acceptance, if they are not talking about equal access care for all bodies, are they actually anti-diet? Unsurprisingly, she is neck deep in fat acceptance, but she also said that fat acceptance doesn't promote obesity, but she also believes that you cannot use intuitive eating and promote weight loss. She got really mad at this other intuitive eating dietitian for saying that you can lose weight and intuitively eat. When you want to lose weight with intuitive eating, you have- mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, what did you just say? When you want to lose weight with intuitive eating? Hmm, registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor here, and that's actually against our code of ethics. Didn't spend about more than 10 seconds on this woman's page, but all I saw was like healthy thin mentality or some bull wait, I don't know, fucking weight loss. This is the shit I can't stand. This is not intuitive eating. This person is not an intuitive eating professional and they are tarnishing, ruining, and harming the intuitive eating message. So she believes weight loss is bad. And I think if you, as a dietitian, are preventing overweight people from ever losing weight, I would consider that promoting obesity. Especially because in the last video, she all but said that being fat has no health problems, which is obviously wrong. And that also has nothing to do with basic respect and human rights, which is what she said fat acceptance was about. All you're doing is encouraging people to remain unhealthy. And I'm glad at the end she mentioned how closely linked anti-diet culture and intuitive eating is to fat acceptance. Because I hear all the time that like, anti-diet isn't about being unhealthy, it's about being anti-fad diet and being pro-health. But this woman says that you can't be anti-diet and pro-intuitive eating 
and also be for weight loss or against fat acceptance, which from what I've seen is absolutely true and it is unhealthy. I want to share my thoughts with you about protein powder and is it a part of diet culture? But if you do choose to consume supplements, I invite you to think about what is your intention behind adding protein powder into your daily routine? Are you adding protein powder into your daily routine because you feel like you have to, or you should be doing it, or it's the only thing that you're allowed to have at different meals and snacks? Or are you adding protein powder because it adds enjoyment and satisfaction into your meals and snacks? It adds a simple serving of protein to your meals and snacks. And you notice that it helps you balance your blood sugar and keep you fuller longer, AKA more energy. See how these intentions are very different from each other? The first set of intentions is rooted in diet culture, making decisions based on external influences and rules. The second set of intentions is based out of an act of self-care, choosing to do something because we actually want to do it and we enjoy it. So there's no black or white answer here and the answer is gonna be different for everybody. So if you are genuinely interested on adding protein powder into your meals and snacks to increase your nutrient content and enjoyment, then I recommend it. Nope, you're not about to get free advertising on my channel. The rest of this video is just her advertising the protein powder she makes. So she's basically saying that whether something is diet culture depends on your intentions with it. But I hate this mentality because it starts to give license to people to judge other people's intentions. Like, it's okay if you use protein powder for this reason, but it's problematic if you do it for this reason. It's the same as weight loss for health is okay, but weight loss for looking better is problematic. It's not your place to judge someone else's intentions if it doesn't affect you. And she's all for intuitive eating, but very few people consume protein powder intuitively, like they would eat a cookie or a piece of cake. But like she said, they want to consume extra nutrients or moderate their blood sugar, which is why they consume protein powder to improve their health. But if someone wants to lose weight to reduce their joint problems or their sleep apnea or fatigue that come from being overweight, you can't do that. So non-intuitively eating protein powder to get more nutrients is okay because it's about being healthier, but eating non-intuitively to lose weight and improve your health is wrong. Don't do that. So our bodies apparently know exactly what they want and we should all eat intuitively like babies with the breast milk to get all of our nutrient needs met. But if for some reason your body has a minor glitch and doesn't naturally consume as much protein as it should, which I don't even know how that would happen because our bodies are perfect functioning machines that intuitively eat everything we could possibly need in our diets. But if that does happen, you can non-intuitively eat some protein powder. That is okay. And oh my god, I happen to have some protein powder right over here that I'm selling. What a coincidence. But I really wanted to address this comment and thank you, thank you, thank you to the person who was so courageous and left this comment. And first of all, I want to apologize. We never want to trigger anybody on this page. But I did a previous post that was how to make peace with food sponsored by Yasso bars. They are Greek yogurt bars, a frozen dessert. And somebody left this comment and I thought it was a great thing to address. So first of all, please know that we will never, ever take a paid partnership unless we actually consume the product. Meaning I actually eat Yasso bars and I really love them. I also eat many other kinds of frozen desserts and love those too. But I think what this person is referring to that on the front of a Yasso box, there is a little circle that says 100 calories per bar. Now this is very different than a brand calling out slim, thin, or like 100 calories per bar to help you lose weight, etc. I would invite you to go through your pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and look up how many food items call out the calorie amount per serving in the item in addition to the nutrition label on the back. Unfortunately, it's just a part of our food system. So do I care that there's 100 calories in the bar? No. If there were 400 calories in the bar, still wouldn't care. Now I can see how this can be triggering to somebody that's recovering from an eating disorder because they're thinking, oh my gosh, I have to eat this because it's 100 calories. When really the brand is just calling that out. I like to think of it like there's the 100 calorie snack pack of almonds. I sometimes buy those because they're easy to throw in a purse or a bag or on the go. It doesn't mean I'm only allowed to have 100 calories of almonds, it's just easy to pack with me on the go. This video also confuses me. She's still talking about the intentions behind why someone would have 100 calories labeled on their box. Apparently it's fine if a brand advertises that they only have 100 calories in their product, as long as they don't mention body size. But calories are almost exclusively associated with weight. 
But how is advertising that you have 100 calories in your product not implying that less calories are better than something with more calories? Or else why would they be advertising that they have low-calorie foods? And how is that not associated with body size? This is just like her rationalization of protein powder, that it's fine to consume protein powder as long as it's for nutritional needs and not to control body size. You can eat the 100-calorie snack packs as long as you're not limiting yourself to only one. This brand is just casually calling out that they only have 100 calories in their ice cream bars. It's not like they went out of their way to make sure each bar only had 100 calories so they could advertise that so they can get people that only want to eat lower calorie foods and watch their weight to buy their product. No, no, no. They just put it on the box because it's a simple observation. <laughs> There's no diet culture motives behind this. And to be clear, I don't care if a brand advertises having only 100 calories, but for someone that's so against diet culture and calorie counting and diet foods, her rationalization of a brand advertising 100 calories that she is paid to promote and people eating protein powder, which she also makes and sells herself, seems a bit to me like her anti-diet principles get a bit more flexible when money is involved. And, and... Remember when she got angry at that email of a woman with a tape measure? Yeah, this one. See this, this tape? This tape measure? Right here? And this bowl of fruit? This is diet culture. This is 100% fat phobic. But you see this label over here? 100 calories? This isn't diet culture. They're just pointing out that they have 100 calories. That's, we don't know why they did that. But you see this tape measure? Th this is fat phobia. But why is she assuming the intentions behind this tape measure? Maybe they're measuring to see if someone got larger. Maybe they're measuring to see if someone has gained more muscle. Maybe the tape measure is used to measure the fruit. We don't know. I like girthy fruit. I like apples that are five inches and above. Don't judge. That's my personal preference. But she's assuming that this tape measure is used to measure if someone lost weight but she won't assume that this 100 calorie label has anything to do with body weight. That doesn't click for me. Join me in making my favorite quick, convenient breakfast idea, blueberry vanilla overnight oats with protein powder. Before we get into the recipe, let's talk about all things meal prep and intuitive eating. We often get the question, if I am meal prepping, am I on a diet? If you have been dieting for five, 10, 20 plus years, the idea of meal prepping probably feels really icky to you. So ask yourself, what is my intention behind meal prep? Do you do it because you have to? Do you do it because you don't want to break food rules? Once you make peace with food and drop the guilt around food, you'll find that you start to consume more of those fun foods, those play foods, the ones that diet culture would call crap or junk. This is a normal part of intuitive eating, so do not worry. And as you progress on your intuitive eating journey, you're gonna find that your intention behind meal prep really starts to shift. You'll find that you might wanna prep meals because it makes life easier and more convenient. See how these intentions are very different from what I was saying before? Do you have to meal prep in order to be considered healthy? Absolutely freaking not. But if you find yourself with the desire of wanting to prep food to make your life easy and get easy, convenient nourishment, this is not diet culture. This TikTok threw me for a loop because it never crossed my mind that meal prep means that you aren't intuitively eating. That's like asking if eating leftovers isn't intuitive eating. If I eat yesterday's dinner at 12 p.m. today, am I participating in diet culture? What the f***? And another thing is that this mentality of eating whatever, whenever, and not eating anything that you don't want in that moment is almost certainly going to cause a bunch of food waste. Like that other TikTok where she's throwing away the jelly beans. And that's just candy. But what if you do have leftovers and you refuse to eat them the next day because you're into intuitive eating and your body doesn't want that right now. And then you end up throwing the food out. When you first start your intuitive eating journey, you have to make peace with food and have unconditional permission to eat all foods. The thought of meal prepping something with intuitive eating can actually feel really diety and really restrictive because you have to be able to ask yourself in the moment, what do I want right now? What am I feeling? What would be satisfying? But meal prep can also serve as an act of self-care as you continue to make peace with food. I can't believe this whole anti-diet thing has gone so far that people are questioning if they eat food that they made an hour ago or a day ago or two days ago, if they're participating in diet culture. 
simply having the option to evaluate for every meal and every snack what you want to eat and then being able to buy that food makes you one of the luckiest people in the world. And to take it to these extremes is really entitled. All of this seems like a recipe for massive food waste. This video is for you if you have come from diet culture and now you're exploring intuitive eating but you feel like you have no idea what you're doing and you have no way to track your progress. Remember, when we come from diet culture, the only thing we are tracking is how to shrink our body and how to lose weight. When we come over to the intuitive eating paradigm, that is not a measure of progress. That is not something that we are tracking. That is not something that we are celebrating because we know that weight does not equal health. So this is the first video in the series looking at specifically how has dieting interfered with your life from a physical standpoint. Do you have signs of, and we're going to walk through some of these things. If you are noticing that you check all of these boxes, please know that, that means there's nothing wrong with you. This is just an indicator that dieting has definitely had an impact on your overall health. All right. So we can look here. Do you have signs of weight gain? We know that dieting is the number one indicator of weight gain. So if you've gone on a diet, lost weight, and then you gain weight, more weight back after coming off of that diet, that's not because your body doesn't work properly. That's because weight gain happens when we diet right? Blunt in metabolism. When we go through periods of restriction and binging, it blunts our metabolism. Cravings for carbs. I'm talking super intense cravings, usually a fear around carbs as well. Blood sugar swings. So you may feel periods of just like dizzy, groggy, low cognitive function, disconnected from hunger cues and satiety cues. So you can't tell when you're hungry or full. You really don't know what satisfies you whenever you're like, what do I want to eat? It's really hard to answer that question. Chronically tired, even if you are sleeping well or getting the recommended seven to nine hours per night, hair falling out more than usual. It's normal to have hair falling out, but like huge clumps of hair uh, where it really feels concerning. And if female missed or inconsistent periods or menses, and do you feel physically numb? So do you have regular periods? Do your periods come, you know, at the same time, generally speaking, every month? And then as for that last one, do you just feel like this overwhelming sense of numbness all the time? Okay. These are all examples of how dieting has interfered with your life physically. All I have to say about this is what about the physical science of junk food culture? of constantly consuming fast food and processed foods like most people in the United States do. In an earlier TikTok, she talked about how it's basically impossible for joint pain or back pain or foot pain to be caused by excess weight, so gaining weight can't cause joint problems or presumably sleep problems or any other physical ailments, but weight gain and sleep problems and craving for carbs could be a sign of diet culture infection? And I'm not a doctor, but I can think of 10 illnesses off the top of my head that come with a combination of these symptoms. Thyroid issues, diabetes, depression could lead someone to gain weight and have sleep problems and be disconnected from their own hunger cues. Also, these are the most vague symptoms. These are the ones that doctors put on intake forms you know when you go to the doctor and before you go in, they have you fill out the form where they ask you, have you lost weight? Have you gained weight? Have you had mood issues? Have you been sleeping normally? All those questions that you fill out and then you go to the appointment and the doctor looks at it and then asks more questions to determine if there's a problem. Yeah, she took all those questions and then added, do you feel numb physically? and said that if you have any combination of these symptoms, you might just have diet culture disease, all from having sleep problems and a blunted metabolism. <sighs> Why do we even have doctors when we have questionnaires like this? Overall, I don't recommend listening to this woman. She seems um, suspect in her motives. All of this is just so ridiculous. I can't believe that she actually has a dietetics degree. <sighs> she gives dietetics a bad name. But anyway, that's the end of the video. Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments, and I will see you in the next video.